Well, now, it's pretty obvious, I think, that when we talk about life having or not having a meaning, we're not using quite the ordinary sense of the word meaning as the attribute of a sign. We're not saying, are we, that we expect this natural universe to behave as if it were a collection of words signifying something other than themselves. It isn't a point of view which would reduce our lives and the world merely to the status of signs. And it's obviously in some different sense than that <clears throat> that Goethe wrote his famous lines at the end of Faust, Alles vergänglicher ist nur ein Gleichnis. Forgive my pronunciation of German. All that is mortal or all that is perishable is but a symbol. And so, a symbol of what? What do we want to feel? What would satisfy us as being the meaning behind this world? It's so often, you know, that we don't follow our ideas and our desires through. Most of the things that we want very fervently are things that we've only half glimpsed. Our ideals are very often suggestions, hints, and we don't know really exactly what we mean when we think about it. But there is this obscure sense in which we feel that life ought to have significance and be a symbol in at least that sense, if not just so uh, arid a symbol as a mere sign. Or it also may mean that life is meaningful. An individual feels that his life amounts to something when he belongs and fits in with the execution of some uh, group enterprise. He feels he belongs in a plan. And this too seems to give people a sense of great satisfaction. But we have to pursue that question further too. Why is it that a plan, why is it that a fellowship with other people gives the sense of meaning? Does it come down perhaps to another sense of meaning, that life is felt to be meaningful when one is fully satisfying one's biological urges? Uh, including uh, the sense of hunger, the sense of love, the sense of uh, self-expression in activity, and so on. But then again, we have to push that inquiry further. What do our biological urges really point towards? Are they just, however, things always projected towards the future. Is biology and its uh, processes nothing but going on towards going on towards going on? Well, now, if we go back to the first point, taking Goethe's words that all that is transitory is but a symbol, and that we want to feel that all things have significance, it does seem to me that there's a sense in which we often use the word significance, where the word seems to be chosen quite uh, naturally, and yet at the same time it's not quite the right word. We say, for example, often of music, that we feel it to be significant, when just at the same time we don't mean that it expresses some particular kind of concretely realizable emotion and certainly it's not imitating the noises of nature. Felt to be significant, not because it means something other than itself, but because it is so satisfying as it is. And we use then this word significance. So often, in those moments when uh, our impetuous seeking for fulfillment cools down, and we give ourselves a little space to watch things, as if they were worth watching, ordinary things. And in those moments when our inner turmoil has really quietened, 
we find significance in things that we wouldn't expect to find significant at all. I mean, this is, after all, the art of those photographers who have such genius in turning the camera towards such things as peeling paint on an old door or mud and sand and stones on a dirt road and showing us there that if we look at it in a certain way, those things are significant. But we can't say significant of what so much as significant of themselves. Or perhaps significance then is the quality of a state of mind in which we notice that we are overlooking the significance of the world by our constant quest for it later. All this language is, of course, quite naturally vague and imprecise because I think the wrong word is used. And yet not entirely the wrong word because, as I said, it comes so naturally to us. Uh, it was Clive Bell, the great aesthetician, who wanted to say that all the characteristic of art, especially the characteristic of um, aesthetic success in painting, was the creation of significant form. Again, a very vague, imprecise expression. But it certainly is an attribute, not only of those moments in which we are tranquil inside, but also of moments of deep spiritual experience, that in those moments the significance of the world seems to be the world, seems to be what is going on now. And we don't look any further. The scheme of things seems to justify itself at every moment of its unfoldment. Again, the character of this feeling, uh, just because uh, our system needs nourishment. I remember quite recently there was an article in the Consumer Reports about bread. And uh, there had been some correspondence and protests saying that the bread one bought, white bread one buys in the stores, is uh, perfectly inedible and lacking in nutrition. And that uh, it was much better to eat um, peasant-type breads, rough pumpernickel and things of that kind. And the experts replied that uh, our white bread is perfectly full of good nutrients and uh, there's nothing really the matter with it at all. Well, I felt like saying... It isn't a matter, perhaps, of the bread being deficient in the essential vitamins. Bread isn't medicine, it's food. And one's complaint against it is that it's bad cookery. It tastes of nothing. And uh, we do tend, don't we, to look upon food so often for what it will do for us rather than the delight of, of eating it. But if the satisfaction of biological urges is to mean anything, surely the point of these urges is not the fatuous one of mere survival, of, we might say, the, the point of the individual is simply that he contributes to the, to the welfare of the race. And uh, the point of the race is that it reproduces itself, to reproduce itself, to reproduce itself and keep going. So, if I may start by insulting your intelligence with what is called the most elementary lesson. The thing that we should have learned before we learned 1, 2, 3 and A, B, C, but somehow was overlooked. Now, this lesson is quite simply this, that any experience that we have through our senses, whether of sound or of light or of touch, is a vibration. And a vibration has two aspects, one called on and the other called off. Vibration is, seems to be propagated in waves and every wave system has crests and it has troughs. And so life is a system of now you see it, now you don't. And these two aspects always go together. For example, sound is not pure sound, it is a rapid alternation of sound and silence. And that's simply the way things are. Only you must remember that the crest and the trough of a wave are inseparable. Nobody ever saw crests without troughs or troughs without crests. Just as negatives are different, they're at the same time one.
And one has to get used fundamentally to the notion that different things can be inseparable. That what is explicitly two can at the same time be implicitly one. If you forget that, very funny things happen. If therefore we forget, you see, that black and white are inseparable, and that existence is constituted equivalently by being and non-being, then we get scared. And we have to play a game called, uh-oh, black might win. And once we get into the fear that black, the negative side, might win, we are compelled to play the game, but white must win. And from that start all our troubles. Because, you see, the human awareness is a very odd mechanism. I don't think mechanism is quite the right word, but it'll do for the moment. That is to say, we have as a species specialized in a certain kind of awareness, which we call conscious attention. And by this we have the faculty of examining the details of life very closely. We can restrict our gaze, and it corresponds somewhat to the peripheral field, I mean the, the central field of vision in the eyes. We have central vision, we have peripheral vision. Central vision is that which we use for reading, for all sorts of close work, and it's like using a spotlight, whereas peripheral vision is more like using a floodlight. Now, civilization and civilized human beings for maybe 5,000 years, maybe much longer, have learned to specialize in concentrated attention. Even if a person's attention span is short, he is, as it were, wavering his spotlight over many fields. The price which we pay for specialization in conscious attention is ignorance of everything outside its field. I would rather say ignorance than ignorance, because if you concentrate on a figure, you tend to ignore the background. You tend, therefore, to see the world in a disintegrated aspect. You take separate things and events seriously, imagining that these really do exist, when actually they have the same kind of existence as an individual's interpretation of a Rorschach plot. They're what you make out of it. In fact, our physical world is a system of inseparable differences. Everything exists with everything else. But we contrive not to notice that, because what we notice is what is noteworthy. And we notice it in terms of notation. Numbers, words, images. What is notable, noteworthy, notated, noticed, is what appears to us to be significant, and the rest is ignored as insignificant. And as a result of that, we select from the total input that goes to our senses only a very small fraction. And this causes us to believe that we are separate beings, isolated by the boundary of the epidermis from the rest of the world. And you see, this is also the mechanism involved in not noticing that black and white go together. Not noticing that every inside has an outside. And that the inside, what inside, goes on inside your skin, is inseparable from what goes on outside your skin. Do you see that, uh, for example, in the science of ecology, one learns that a human being is not an organism in an environment, but is an organism hyphen environment. 
That is to say, a unified field of behavior. If you describe carefully the behavior of any organism, you cannot do so without at the same time describing the behavior of the environment. And by that you know that you've got a new entity of study. You are describing the behavior of a unified field. But you must be very careful indeed not to fall into old Newtonian assumptions about the billiard ball nature of the universe. The organism is not the puppet of the environment, being pushed around by it. Nor, on the other hand, is the environment the puppet of the organism, being pushed around by the organism. The relationship between them is, to use John Dewey's word, transactional. A transaction being a situation like buying and selling, in which there is no buying unless somebody sells and no selling unless somebody buys. So that fundamental relationship between ourselves and the world, which is in an old-fashioned way by people such as Skinner, who have, not, who have not updated his philosophy, interpreted in terms of Newtonian mechanics. He interprets the organism as something determined by the total environment. And he doesn't see that in a more modern way of talking about it, we're simply describing a unified field of behavior, which is nothing more than what any mystic ever said. That's a dirty word uh, in the modern academic scientific environment. But um, if a mystic is one who is sensibly or even sensuously aware of his inseparability as an individual from the total existing universe. He is simply a person who has become sensible, aware through his senses of the way ecologists see the world. So when I'm in academic circles, I don't talk about mystical experience. I talk about ecological awareness. Same thing. And uh, so the next aspect of our metaphysical introduction must be about games. We've got a system of schooling which gives a completely different impression. It's all graded. And what we do is we put the child into the corridor of this grade system with a kind of, come on, kitty, kitty, kitty. And yeah, you go to kindergarten, you know. And that's a great thing because when you finish that, you'll get into first grade. And then, come on, first grade leads to second grade, and so on, and then you get out of grade school, you've got high school, and it's revving up, the thing is coming, then you're going to go to college, and by Jove, then you get into graduate school, and when you're through with graduate school, you go out to join the world. And then you get into some racket where you're selling insurance, and they've got that quota to make, and you're going to make that. And all the time, the thing is coming. It's coming, it's coming, that great thing, the, the success you're working for. Then when you wake up one day about 40 years old, you say, my God, I've arrived. <laughs> I'm there. And you don't feel very different from what you always felt. And there's a slight letdown because you feel there's a hoax. And there was a hoax, a dreadful hoax. They made you miss everything by expectation. Look at the people who live to retire and put those savings away. And then when they're 65, they don't have any energy left, they're more or less impotent, and uh, they go and rot in an old people's, senior citizen's community. <laughs> For self-frustration. Let's take uh, Kozhebsky called man a time binder. That means that he's the animal peculiarly aware of the time sequence. And as a result of this, is able to do some very remarkable things. He can predict. He studies what's happened in the past, and he says the chances are so and so of that happening again. And so he predicts. Well, this is very useful to be able to predict, because that has survival value. But at the same time, it creates anxiety. You pay for this increased survival ability involved in prediction by knowing that in the end you won't succeed. You're all going to fall apart by one way or another. It might happen tomorrow, it might happen 50 years from now. 
but it all comes apart in the end. And the people get worried about that, they get anxious. So what they gained on the roundabout, they lost on the swings. We can look upon different creatures as we look at different games, as we look at chess, checkers, backgammon, tennis, with the tree game, the beetle game, the grass game, or you can look at them as you look at different styles of music, mazurkas, waltzes, um, sonata, etc., etc., all down the line. There are all these different things doing their stuff. And they're going to do to do to do to do to hoo do to do you know, in different rhythms. And we're doing that. If you were in a flying saucer from Mars or somewhere, and you came and looked, try and make out what was living on this world, from about 10,000 feet at night or early morning, you would see these great ganglia with tentacles going out all over the place. And early in the morning, you see little uh, blobs of luminous particles going into the middle of them. See? And then uh, in the late afternoon or early evening, it would spit them all out again. And they'd say, well, this thing, this thing breathes. And it does it in a special rhythm. It goes in and out, in and out, in and out, once every 24 hours. But then it rests a day and doesn't spit so much. It spits in a different way. That's a kind of irregularity, and then it starts spitting all over again the same way. Well, I say that's very interesting. That's the kind of thing we, we have, see? This is something that goes this way.